Well, thanks all for joining. I see we got a pretty good attendee list this time around. This webinar is being recorded, um, so it'll be posted on VLAB site, uh, which will be the first topic here. We'll discuss very briefly, uh, and then got some of the similar topics that we had in the last webinar, um, and talk a little bit about uh, some stuff in the top down. Uh, I think this is going to be a good webinar because we've had some. Now we've had some mixed precipitation events that hit, hit central region, um, both you know some heavier snow, some ice. So you know, this is a, a good good time for this webinar. Um, first on the VLab site, uh, as you saw from the you know previous slide, the website address, which I could put on the next slide too. Um, please visit that. Uh, there's some good stuff on there, um, including the you know like frequently asked questions. Uh, I think there. I don't know exactly the number that's on there, but it might be like, you know, it's at least in the teens of various questions. So if you, you know, if you find yourself uh, or forecaster on a, you know, midnight shift or something, have a have a question and answer might be right there in that FAQ. Uh, also, uh, don't don't forget there's this blog section on the right that will have various um, news items being posted there, including like, you know, information on how to register for this webinar. Uh, and uh, you also have, there's that, uh, it's not highlighted in red, but that development spreadsheet of all the FAQs so you can see what's going on in the development process, what's getting addressed, and what's, you know, what's coming for the next, uh, next install, those kind of things. So first I wanted to show some of uh, some, you know, call the positive news, what's kind of come out of the forecast builder thus far. And this comes, you may have seen this in Chris Drager's uh, uh, all hands email, but you know, really great, uh, really great consistency with some of the snowfall um, forecasts from that no November seventeenth, uh, eighteenth, nineteenth uh, event. Uh, this image taken, you know, this is from you know late in the evening on the fifteenth, and a seventy-two hour forecast. I mean, there's a, even detail, I and mean, you can actually see the you know the Missouri River there going through you know near Pipe Pier, and you've got. You know, some of the heavier snowfall depicted up over northern Minnesota, which occurred, and that's going to jump me to my next point here, is that if you look at the actual observed um, snowfall analysis, albeit that this goes 12 more hours beyond, and there's a lot more snow going on up in northern Minnesota after the previous image. I mean, you had the same same kind of layout. Actually, the totals look pretty <laughs> pretty similar, so that was, uh, you know, again, really positive um, look at that. And here's just another image from that event. Uh, this one created on the, the 17th, so now kind of trying to encompass that heavier snowfall period in northern Minnesota. And again, um, you know, that's that's taken into account. So I think that's you know that's really awesome. You know, exactly what what we've been going for. If you remember the introductory presentation on July 27th, this, this you know looking at snow and ice consistency. This is something that we've been wanting. To on to attack, and you know we certainly see an improvement there. Both consistency and even accuracy is pretty is pretty good. Um, just a couple more images. This is from uh, our next mix mix precip event, or if I guess our kind of really first one to deal with um, from the twenty from the twenty second going into the twenty third, and you know really nice uh, consistency here on 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 snowfall amount. And even looking at ice accumulation, that's pretty similar uh, as well, albeit it's all white icing. There wasn't any significant icing at this event, but it was really our first, you know, running into freezing, into freezing rain. So uh, I want to jump into some, uh, some science topics, some model topics, and there's going to be some pauses along the way through here for, uh, for you guys to uh, provide some feedback as well. The first item here to talk about is there's some changes coming to the Canadian model. This is outside of what just happened that you know the regional Canadian just uh, just stopped. We're trying to get that get that resolved by switching to the the, the 10 kilometer 10 kilometer grid. But this is completely um, besides um, besides that. During the um, the next National SmartNet version 4.2 is going to have some changes for the Canadian, particularly the northern northern hemisphere where I think currently it's like might be like 60 kilometer or something like that. Well, it's going to drop down to 25 kilometer horizontal resolution, and we're going to have much more vertical level data. And that goes out six. I think it's going to be six hourly through 240. 
um, different than what we current, much different than what we currently have in in AWIPS. Uh, this is something that's being coordinated across all regions uh, to get to get done. And with that more vertical level data, we'll be able to get it added to the top down blends. We should also have it uh, added um, better for you know better data for snow ratio calculation as well. So with this, when that tech order comes out, there will be some changes necessary to your LBM feed on LDAD. Um, just an FYI on that. And Milwaukee is currently alpha, alpha testing um, the necessary changes so that we can get it all written up in part of the, as part of the tech order. Switching, <laughs> switching gears here a little bit uh, was, uh, I, I, Kind of want to bring up since I know this was common to even well here at Lacrosse we were kind of helping people along with this is that um, people you know seeing freezing rain when your temperatures were above freezing like what's going on here well it's really that the the dew point is important uh, something I think that maybe we've kind of blown off in past you know in, in the past because you know dew point really maybe don't pay attention to it as much in the winter time. Well, in this case, it does become important. Uh, when you have temperatures that are just above freezing and your dew points are below freezing, resulting in a wet bulb that's below freezing, and you get ice, icing. And in fact, I'm going to show you some observations of this that happened on November 22nd. They have a little quick, a little quick presentation here that um, Dan Baumgart, the Sioux here at La Crosse, and myself uh, kind of row it up. We try to do it the same the day of while things were really fresh and going on at the same time. So um, there's two there's actually two different issues in this event. Um, first is going down to here a little bit of uh, issues with the the warm nose. Um, we had some precipitation moving in, the kind of your, your initial initial wave, generally pretty light. Well, um, we have, as part of the top-down process, we use the max wet bulb aloft. Uh, this works pretty well from what, you know, we looked at all the, res all, you know, our research that, you know, all the soundings, you could pretty much interchange them, but the problem is at the initial saturate, you know, initial time period of having that precip come in, the hydrometeors are still going to feel uh, the temperature, like on sounding on the right, for example, where you have you know, max the max temperature loft is two to three centigrade, which would yield more of a more of a sleet type uh, situation, maybe even freezing rain if you got a little bit closer to three. Whereas max level loft is zero, which suggests the snow. And so you can you can compare these in uh, in GFE. Uh, we'll and I think in the next next tech order we'll add max T loft so you can compare this for uh, especially for initial precipitation onset. Uh, you can see the difference between max temperature loft and max wet bulb quite you know quite significant, especially all over you know, over southern Minnesota, northern Iowa there, uh, and with you know, could be max T loft would suggest freezing rain, whereas max wet bulb would suggest you know snow or maybe sleet. So in this uh, in this event, we ended up with some free, uh, more freezing rain or sleet stuff. And even here at the even here at the office, we were um, in La Crosse, we were experiencing uh, sleet and even I think a little bit of rain kind of mixed mixed in with that. And uh, that would fit more of the max T loft rather than the max wet bulb. So consider that in these instances to populate the max T loft into the max wet bulb. And then, of course, collaborate that in the process. All right. The next thing is is this uh, freezing, you know, this freezing rain that's happening when your temperatures are above freezing. So this goes back to the into your uh, into the training uh, modules. It's mentioned in a few few spots, uh, but going into the uh, freezing rain accumulation model or FRAM, that ice accumulation has been observed when the temperatures are above freezing and the wet bulbs below freezing. Um, but the, when the wet bulbs above freezing, ice accumulation has been rarely observed. So in the probability weather type in the backbone of forecast builder, when uh, 
temperature, you know, is greater than 32 in the wet bulb, as noted on the top, top there, uh, or if you know temperature is greater than 35 Fahrenheit, you're just going with this is just going to be straight rain. However, if the temperature is between that 33, 34 range and the wet bulb's below 32. You know, so again, there's your dew points going below below freeze, and you're going to get this freeze and rain rain mix. And then when both temperature and wet bulb are below are below freezing, it's a freeze and rain situation. So let me show an example from from that no, that day on November 22nd, where uh, this is the radar on the right and surface obs. You will see that at like at Mason City there, uh, North Central Iowa, it was reporting temperatures of, you know, temperature of 34, dew point 26, and it was accumulating ice, uh, the ice sensor there at up to 16Z, suggesting 200 already of ice. Rochester uh, also seen a trace of icing with a temperature above freezing, and even well off to the northwest, not shown in the radar image, but Grand Forks also seen icing with the temperature above freezing. So, again, that's, that's stuff to, that's stuff to keep in yeah, you know, keep in the back of your mind. And in fact, here's a couple of images from webcams that we we try to grab, showing some of the icing that's uh, already showing up on the on the cameras themselves. So, uh, but when we you know, go go into the go into the research, and uh, Dan and I have been coordinating with uh, Brian Barshbrook and Chris Sanders about this, is that from the research that. You know, icing generally occurs about 30% of the time for the scenario with, with the temp with the temperatures between 33 and 34 in the wet bulb below freezing. So we're looking towards, in the next tech, tech order with January, maybe to reduce the amount of freezing rain that gets produced, or at least reduce that probability of freezing rain, put a different ratio on it. Um, but no matter what, the dew point matters here. I saw I saw a raised hand for uh, Audra. Uh, I think I have you unmuted. <laughs> yeah, I'm over at the Topeka office. Um, I have a question with regards to mixed precip type, as you were mentioning, freezing rain. How do we handle it in the extended period? It's been cropping up and handling the earlier this week for doing forecasts for this weekend, Saturday night into Sunday, when it's been falling into day six and day seven. So when you start dropping out the number of models that we're able to load in into Forecast Builder with your top-down tools, and plus with high model uncertainty that we were dealing with between the GFS and the Euro, and obviously the Euro not getting embedded into it, it was spitting out freezing rain and sleet. How are we to best handle that situation when we are not confident with having that precip type uh, day six, day seven in the forecast? Great, great question, Audra. In fact, uh, one of my slides here, upcoming two two slides down, we'll uh, we'll get to that point. So, <laughs> thank you for bringing that up, though. All right, all right, Eric. I uh, see your hands up. Yeah, Andy. Um, question I had: dew, uh, the dew point, or I guess the whip bulb, is fairly important. Uh, but you, I don't think, I don't think you can view the wet bulb grids within GFE. It seems like they're just kind of calculated in the background and utilized and then not necessarily populated. Is there a way to view that that I'm not aware of? Yeah, correct. correct. Uh, yeah, it's all calculated in the background. I, you know, I've been thinking about this about maybe that within the step four when you go to the precip types or may, you know, maybe before um, that I could generate the, the, wet, the wet bulb or it could, you know, yeah, you know, we'll have to we'll have to think about it. But there, I think there are a couple instances where we can generate the uh, a wet bulb uh, wet bulb grid. Because I think that would be of, of use so that you can kind of see that. Because exactly exactly like you're saying. I mean, the other thing is you just look at you just look at your dew point, and if your dew point's below freezing, you run the risk of having you know freezing rain in the for, uh, freezing rain in the uh, forecast there. Yeah, I, we were just kind of wondering if there's a way to look at that since it is pretty, you know, a pretty vital component for a pretty high impact weather element. Uh -huh. We'll talk about it on the grid team too. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think I had maybe some other questions, but I'll see what else you have to present first. Okay. All right. I'll continue on here. 
So our next, next thing that's come up uh, quite a bit in feedback has been stratiform shower precipitation. And you know, this has actually been something that's been going on even you know, pre-forecast builder and you know, coronating this. And I think that the thing here is that we should try to keep this, you know, try to keep this simple. You know, if you have, maybe you have a mix of stratiform and shower precipitation going on across your forecast area, just, just go with one or the other. Um, you know, to you know, you think about it to the public that they're both going to kind of tell you the public the same thing. It's precipitating. Um, just kind of looking at it from that vantage point. Uh, the grid team uh, has also, on this whole topic, has offered up a suggestion to the consistency team that you know, let's just remove shower altogether, um, and we just have and we just have stratiform. I know this can be a big change. This could be a big change because we've been used to having the two designations, the stratiform shower, but there are many benefits to this. One would be, of course, simplifying code, and we want to have a, you know, a rain showers and a rain grid, a snow and a snow showers, because we just have rain and snow. In fact, I think we already have this situation present with freezing rain, because we don't have a freezing rain showers uh, weather element. Also, simplify collaboration. You want to be collaborating on, you know, you know I want to have shower here. Can you do shower as well? You know, we wouldn't need that. And then, of course, ISD traffic would be simplified because we want to have, again, that rain shower grid, just have rain. And then the weather grid, of course, would get simpler as well. You want to have both stratiform and showery type uh, present. And then, and then, again, as I was saying, for the public, both stratiform and shower are telling them the same thing, it's precipitating, or at least there's a chance for, you know, chance for it. Of course, as I mentioned too, we're going to lose that nice, you know, I think you have, there's a nice ring to it, scattered showers and thunderstorms, you know, that kind of phraseology. Uh, so uh, I wanted to bring this up, that this is something that we've brought, and the grid team has brought up to the consistency team, and I think it would be a big, it would be a big benefit. Uh, again, I'm going to open this up for questions, and I'll unmute, unmute people as you raise your hand. So first, I see Eric's got a hand. <laughs> or maybe that was from before. Sorry, Eric. <laughs> Doesn't look like any hands raised or questions on this. So we'll, we'll jump on to the next, next topic. Top down, days four through seven. Uh, this also has been a consternation across the uh, forecast offices, and of course, yeah, what do you do with this? Um, we talked about it quite a bit on the grid team call yesterday, and here's what we've, what we've come up with. Again, after, after I'm done with this slide, I'll open it up for some questions uh, and comments. Uh, offices, as, as it stands right now, with the way forecast builders design, you are you know, permitted to populate the top-down stuff in days four through seven. Note that the cron does not populate these Right, right now, as of what's being installed with the latest, uh, the latest tech order. But we do want to provide some warnings uh, to this: is that if you want to, if you want to include these top downs, that be sure to collaborate because you, the moment you throw these top down grids, particularly max wet bulb aloft, you can start throwing in, you know, mixed precip types, and you wouldn't be that won't be in collaboration with your, you know coordinate well with your neighbors if you start throwing those in. And something Audra alluded to, that as it stands right now, the GFS is the only model for max wet bulb aloft. Um, and whereas for your electric temperature grids, max D minty, you're, you're looking at a much bigger, relatively speaking, uh, set of models going into those grids. So if you throw that GFS in there, you could be complete, you know, for max level of off, you could be completely out of sync even meteorologically and result in a high uh, false alarm for freezing rain and sleet. Uh, and also note that, you know, max level of loft, as you, as you know from the precip type diet and the values map into p-type, slight adjustments in that max level of loft all one degree, especially in that two to, two to three and a half C range can yield big spatial changes to the precipitation types. And one other thing to think about is that if you look at our ver you know, verification scores for max T, min T, and you go through like the fall, winter, spring, in general, they, they seem to lie somewhere in that 
you know, around that five Fahrenheit. And if, you know, we don't have any of the data to back this up, but if, you know, if that would apply to max weapon a lot, you know, you could be looking at difference between snow and freezing rain for a P-type uh, once it became day one. Um, so another, but a well-agreed upon here, recommendations, do not uh, create prob ice beyond day three. Uh, prob prob ice is super, it's super sensitive, uh, and, and its current calculation, you can, again, throw a lot of freezing rain in your forecast that you don't want, so just don't bother with it. If you're going to do a top-down grid, just do max wet bulb. <laughs> Coming up in January, uh, you know, we'll have that Canadian in, so that will at least help to balance the GFS and give us something else for max wet bulb, and we'll reevaluate the possibility to put to put the top-down grids on the on the cron, uh, but that's where things stand as of now. And one other note is that you know you can use other messaging services, you know your news story, HWO, weather story, social media, all those to allude to potential ice and beyond day three. Don't necessarily you know you could have your days four through seven spit out rain, snow, um, and then use these messaging services to say that there could be, uh, a, you know, some various mixed precipitation event with icing and that happening that we just don't know yet how everything's going to work themselves out. So I'm going to pause here and ask if there are any questions, put your hands up if you have any questions and I'll get to them. I see one right, uh, nope, hand went down. <laughs> All right. Jerry, I think you want to make a comment. Um, I would like I would like to go back to uh, Audra and see if uh, see if this answered uh, answered your question at all. <laughs> your phone is unmuted. <laughs> yes, that was a huge help and clarification there. So I get the gist that basically uh, we can when it comes to days four through seven weather grids that we kind of utilize our normal methods. Um, outside of forecast builder to do those grids and as we start getting into the days one through three period uh, it's advised to that's when we can start considering utilizing the forecast builder top-down tools for uh, precip type yeah that that would be the gen that would be the general yeah the general idea here yeah the, ex the extended not you know you know, you're, you're per yeah like we say we're per you're permitted but you don't necessarily have to um, those in. Again, if you if you put those in, collaborate. You know, Perfect. Collaborate. Thank you very much. All right, doing another check through to see anybody else. All right. Um. Uh, my. Uh, Sue here, Dan Baumgart has some has some thoughts too. You want to pass on? Yeah, I guess um, when we look at those recommendations, to me, um, we're we're stepping. You know, our, our original methodology idea here was to come in and do this test to to begin with a consistent starting point, and I'm not sure that this recommendation is along those same lines. Um, we're kind of looking at is trying to reduce our forecast production time and increase the time for messaging. And just from a methodology standpoint, I think we have to kind of stand back and look at if this recommendation is consistent with what we're after. Um, from a science perspective, um, having a single model in the extended time frame or our max wet bulb aloft, and also I think trying to hit mesoscale regions of precipitation type is very, very tricky. So I guess my, I, I guess I'm, I, I think we need to think about this a little bit more. I, I would be more in favor of more of a targeted uh, impact based approach where we see a high impact storm in that day four to day seven and then we target and collaborate the use of top-down grids um, based on that on that type of a methodology, and stick with 
um, just rain and snow in the day four to day seven period and not go into populating top-down grids because I think we all know that if we start populating these grids, some offices do, some offices don't, we're going to start to increase our collaboration time and our grid twiddling, and we're going to have to really inspect those grids. Um, and I'm not sure that that's consistent with our methodology here of trying to reduce forecast production time and move our paradigm over to messaging uh, and putting into putting more time into forecast analysis. So I guess to me, I want to step back and really have everyone think about that recommendation and if that's the direction we want to go. Um, so that's that's my two cents here. Thanks, Dan. I think that's, you know, I think those two are you know, valid points that consider and check. All right, John, looks like and you got your hand up. I'll unmute you. Uh, let's see here. Looks like you'll just have to, you're unmuted, but I think you have to enter your PIN. So I sent I sent you a pen there, John. John, so I'm again. Okay, it looks like John, you should be. I I think you're unmuted, so you can. Okay, there we go. There we go. I think it's all set. John Gagan, can you hear me? Okay, you're on. Uh, so I see your question there. You're on computer. Uh, well, one one thing, John, since you're in the office there with uh, with Jer and Jerry, Jerry, you're uh, Jerry, you're unmuted. Um, Can you hear me? Yep. All right. All right. Go that um, way. <laughs> so I think John has a couple questions. Or oh no, maybe he doesn't. So okay, I guess he was just trying to get me on. <laughs> so. One thing I also yeah. wanted to point out is that one, um, when our office ran these grids in the day four through seven time period, the next person did not. Um, but the grids were still populated. So one caution is if offices do choose to populate these grids in the day four through seven time frame, they will stay there. So if you want to get rid of them, you then have to remove them yourself. And that's another thing that we're looking at. Um, if we're going to allow offices to do this population in day four through seven, we also need to figure out a way to get rid of them. So that's just one one thing I wanted to make a comment on. Hey Jerry, this is Dan in, in La Crosse. I guess my, oh, maybe maybe some of the team members could speak to the consistency and the initial starting point that that was kind of the foundation of this whole experiment um, and and maybe some of the opinions on the team that led us to this recommendation I guess I'd, I'd like to hear well I mean one thing is that you know we we did promise that we would um, create a you know policy of how to create these weather grids and you know by sort of removing this that's we're not really giving people an opportunity to populate anything much more than snow and rain in the extended. Um, so I think that was one of the reasons that we were considering. And another thing is that a lot of the southern sites, and John um, with Springfield was mentioning this, that you know they have a lot of mixed precip events down there. And so by not allowing that, that may be a hindrance to what they can do. So um, I think you know, this is still, this is fresh on the, the board of something that we're talking about and trying to figure out what to do. So by by no means is this, you know, what we're recommending right now, um, you know, going to be the end all game. Um, so we're talking about it and we're trying to figure out what the best policy is. And I, I don't know, is, is Chuck, are you on the call? And Andy, I mean, you can comment further too. Let me see here. Yeah. 
Okay, Chuck, can you? Chuck, I have you un unmuted. <laughs> Now Chuck, Chuck, I know he's on the road trying to listen in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I know there's a lot of different ways here to go. One of the concerns too is, you know, if you yeah, if you don't populate it, then and you do, you know, then just by an automated sense, you definitely wouldn't get any ice, ice, you know, icing type situation in the grids. And maybe there is an icing event out there that you want to have in, which would be the idea of a targeted, targeted approach. Um, I mean, one of the benefits if we did do it all, all the time is that you don't run into that problem of okay, you had grids there, okay, now they, you know, they're getting they're getting stuck, they're not getting refreshed with the latest model data and all that. But again, the question mark is is do all the grids from the models, you know, gonna, um, you know, again, we only have the GFS, which is a pro, which is a problem in itself. Uh, so. Again, it's you know, I think exactly what Jerry Jerry stated that this is something that you know could be a, a little bit of a moving you know moving target recommendation if you will as we continue to get feedback. So I would definitely say that uh, again, like I say, January we're going to reevaluate because that'll be our next tech order. So please please send us uh, you know any feedback. You know you can also do that on you can do that on VLab on the VLab forum nws.forecastbuilder at noah.gov, you know, let us, let us know. Hey, Andy, this is John. Hey, John. Okay, sorry. So finally got Jerry <laughs> on, and uh, I apologize earlier. My phone dropped. Uh, it just dropped out, and I was trying to talk and I couldn't get on there. But, uh, you know, I, I, it, obviously we have a, a, a difficult uh, situation to balance here. Um, and, and one thing I wanted to make sure is that Southern offices who are in this test, you know, definitely had a chance to speak up because the frequency of running into freezing rain situations is so much greater uh, down in those areas. But it, it's also wrought with, you know, potential, you know, DSS messaging impacts because you mentioned freezing rain and people, you know, start to freak out. And you don't want to overdo that either. So we, we've definitely got a balance here. And obviously having a single model source and the extended being the GFS is by no means ideal. But, you know, I do share Jerry's concerns that, uh, you know, what, what we were trying to roll out here was kind of that, uh, that solution that all weather grids would be able to be taken care of by this process. Uh, but we have, you know, obviously substantial limitations beyond day three. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm up in, in where things now are more, more common to be snow uh, than I have in the past, you know, but I do have grave concerns that we are throwing out the ability uh, to easily mention freezing rain situations in the extended, and we're complicating the collaboration process to make that happen. Uh, so, you know, if there's any southern offices that want to chime in, uh, you know, please, uh, please do now because you know, this is something I know is going to greatly affect you. And if we're stuck with just rain, snow, and the grids uh, beyond day three, um, you know, that makes it a big challenge to try and, and message these things when you have a forecast saying one thing, but then your messaging system saying something else. Yeah, John, John good, good, good stuff there. Yeah, that's what I think we're, I think, I guess that idea too that Dan was mentioned about targeting that yeah that we don't have it all the you know if we don't have it all the time but then we can you know target if you put it in that might be a, a way you know a way to do it as well um, that yeah you, know, you see something yeah I, don't, I guess from my end of, so whatever the solution is I just want to make sure it, it, it's as much organically grown from the test bed offices as it is anything else because, you know, in the end, it's the test bed offices that, that are going to have to collaborate this, that they're going to have to message us. And, you know, given the frequency with which freezing rain events do occur, you know, I, I definitely would want to yield to those offices that, that deal with it more frequently. I just saw something come across. Come across the questions uh, block here uh, from Albert Patrika saying about. Hopefully, I said the last name right there. Um, 
and I, th I think it's too uh, a good good thought is that you know given the uh, I'm just going to read it is that given the uncertainty and the extended and have only having one model why not simply have rain snow or wintry mix fall out instead of collaboration nightmare uh, and so this could end up end up heading us in the wrong direction in the extent with too much grid edited in not well collaborated so great you know great thoughts there great feedback there Albert uh, I'm also going to open this up uh, Chris Chris Bowman uh, have you unmuted? Hi. Uh, sorry, we're uh, in, in Pleasant Hill, and, and you just answered our, our or uh, read out out loud what we were talking about here. Just some discussion about um, the inclusion of uh, wintry mix instead of um, you know going with rain, snow, ice, or whatever like that for the days four through seven time period. We were just discussing um, you know what, would wintry mix be a, a possibility to have that in there for the days four through seven time period. Yeah, I think that you know that I think that's certainly a great idea too. Uh, we need to get a weather weather grid change certainly to do that. But I think that I think that's great. I think that would really help. Uh, would kind of help address this. And Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't the National Bun Weather or Weather Team looking into that? Yeah, that was also something yeah, that they've been looking at too, for that four through seven period. I think because of that, you know, statement of uncertainty. But it's true that we yeah, we want a message. We want we need a message, you know, potential ice storms and that out there. Uh, but how to do that, you know, yeah, between point between your point and click forecast and DFD and the other messaging services. Got another hand here, um, Pat Bowden. I have you unmuted. Okay. Uh, first thing, uh, we got a couple questions. One is, if we had wintry mix in four through seven, that would solve, I think, ninety percent of these issues. We could still easily message if we have wintry mix in the, you know, in the grids, and that's what's being spit out to the formatters and such, we could easily message that, hey, it could be a significant icing event. It still means the same to the general public. I think that's the best solution to this whole issue. And then, Greg? Okay. Um, second comment. I um, Yesterday was my first time experience with full, um, the full version in an operational sense, and um, I was trying to um, match up with my neighbors to say a rain snow mix, rain or snow. Now, I could not get, I could not achieve that unless I populated my prop ice grids to 100 percent in the extended. In the extended, I'm sorry. So, um, if if you don't, if you eliminate the prop ice in the extended, you're not going to be able to create a rain snow mix, a rain or snow grid. Is it just going to be rain or it's going to be snow? At least that was my experience yesterday. I can I can help you with that. No, um, yeah, you should not have you, you should not do the 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 prob ice. Um, yeah, the prob ice itself will just do rain. Will will start converting. Will start converting snow over to probably freezing rain given the situation. Many times the situation the prob ice or 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 rain depending on surface temperature. But anyway. Uh, it it might be your max wet bulb off grids out out there may that that are kind of playing some havoc too uh, with that because as your if your max wet bulb loft is say one Celsius and your surface temperatures are above freezing the it's going to think of a top down situation here that your your warm <laughs> surface up to two thousand feet so you're going to get rain <laughs> so I would say that's another that's another area of caution with the max wet bulb. Um, uh, my, max, my max wet bulbs yesterday, none of them were above zero. Okay. I had no warm layer aloft. This, this is Dan Baumgart. I, my experience has been working with offices that if they put any, any of those top-down grids into that forecast in the extended, that they will end up with different outcomes. If you have no top-down grids in your extended, we are basically diagnosing precipitation type from surface temperature, so it'll be a rain or snow. 
So, but you can't have those grids exist. Just delete them, remove them out of there um, to have that scenario. Okay, I was just trying to I was just trying to create a rain snow grid, and I was getting either rain or snow. And the only way I could get the rain snow mix in there with temperatures aloft, all below freezing, no warm layer, was to populate the prob ice with 100 percent. Then it would create a rain snow mix for me. But otherwise, I could not get it to say rain or snow in the weather grid. Yeah, and, and that's. That's something where we'd have to come in and take a look at your grids and see what, what's all in there. But I, the, the code should not be doing that. Um, so I can make sure that everything's OK. And I, I can go into service backup and make sure all your code is, all the, all the code that's in there is good and just be safe. <laughs> OK. Yeah, I had somebody sitting with me, and we were kind of going through it together. So it, yeah. I'm, I, I'm not alone on this as far as my explanation of what went on, but anyway, yeah. I, it was my first time, so anyway, I'm, you know, we're... Oh, we're good on. job. Tre I'm trekking through it, yeah. I know, it can be a change. <laughs> All right, well, I think we'll get one more in here. Uh, uh, Audra, you had another, uh, you had your hand up? Yeah, just providing our two cents uh, based on office discussion that we've been having here. Uh, we, too, were having trouble, as with the last office, of getting the mention of rain, snow, and the extended. And we agree that if we did have the capability of having that option of a wintry mix for uh, part of the extended period, at least days four through seven, that would probably be helpful in um, our messaging and wording if we had that capability. So I know we have support from that concept from our office um, with regards to the original question of how to kind of best handle the approach. Our philosophy would be, based on some of the discussion here, is that we would be fine with, for days four through seven, uh, skipping the top-down step. And if we want to run that process, we would want to just simply collaborate at first with the neighboring offices. But for the sake of to avoid flip-flopping with potential mixed precip getting added in, uh, we would be fine with reserving that for the days one through three period, and just collaborating any changes beyond that uh, for four through seven. Sounds good. Thanks, Ida. Eric, you had a, you have your hand up? Yeah, um, regarding the last little sanity check at the surface that defaults to the 34 to 37, uh, I think that's the rain snow question. Um, I think I emailed you about this. Was there a discussion about using the wet bulb rather than the surface temperature for that in order to be consistent with the other calculations? Yeah, and that'll be on the, that, that's coming up in the in the in the talk. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll I'll wait. Sorry to spill the beans. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's all right. All right, I think I think we'll move on since certainly there's more here in the talk to go. Um, and like I say, send e you know send email to NWS Staff Forecast Builder um, or post on the V Lab. Getting you know feedbacks always welcome. So. Some technical updates in, that are in process here. Uh, first, we, you know, we kind of discussed about prob ice present. Uh, to tar you know, as as the grid stands right now, it can produce a lot of high false alarm rate of you know freezing rain or, or rain. Um, so Dan and I have been doing some work to target to, to to almost kind of redefine the grid a little bit to just just target deep saturated layers for precipitation. You know, when ice is ice in the clouds not present. So um, this is something we're testing here um, at La Crosse. And before we put it into the national uh, national smart in it um, code, we want to make sure that it's, uh, that it's good. Um, based on what we've seen, it's, a, it's an improvement. But it's interesting when you start blending it uh, from what we've been able to, to tell that the, the, the blend could give you, well, one model would say you have ice, the other model says no, and so you get this 50-50 blend. So that's some stuff that we're kind of trying to look at. Uh, 
<laughs> both Dan and I are also doing some research on looking at surface wet bulb. Uh, I've got a big old program, program here which takes in a lot of the stuff that's in the forecast builder code as well as um, some, other, some other decoder stuff to look at Rayob soundings and compare that to surface temperature dew point and, and all variety of parameters. So we're going to look at um, sur surface wet bulb as well as snow level. Um, um, to see to see how these look at for determining a P type. Uh, we're gonna look at I think we've got we're gonna look at like Minneapolis and some other some other spots. So, all right. Uh, some in the, in the feedback to you know talking about some add-in elements to the ones that load at various steps in forecast builder. I know there's been talk about one about maybe to have a weather grid or something. So we'll be looking at that based on the got in the feedback, and then. Uh, also, you know, to note that the weather grids you've, you've probably seen are now adjust, you know, automatically kind of adjust so that they'll they'll like they'll like start combining on you. There is there is a flaw that I've got in there that you sometimes you get one grid that says the same thing as the next. Um, they're both correct. It's just they say the same, and there's usually like a one single hour grid. I still got to figure out what the problem is with that, but um, I'm going to be working on that. Uh, some outstanding technical issues. A lot of these still are actually from the previous um, previous webinar. Uh, we've provided some good feedback here. This is some of from the most of these are items are from the Great Lakes uh, with uh, maybe smoothing with lake with lake effect. I mean, lake effect's got its own issues that it's it's a mesoscale and try and have it on these in these blends. Uh, also, both of these apply to both the national blend and super blend. Um, so. We're looking into looking into those. Also, still looking into diurnal diurnal temperature issues that have been kind of in collaboration with both the Great Lakes Zoo and as well as the, the NWS diurnal developers um, to try and see if we can resolve this. I'm not exactly sure. Um, we may have to try and get some kind of a patch in, if you will, um, to try and handle that. Uh, also, from feedback that we received, and we'll get this change in place that uh, with the cron that the right now the Consra wing. Consra model is used for wind gusts to be, to match what the idea was with putting Consra wind in, but based on the feedback, it sounds like super fun would be better. Um, so that's going in going into place. January. A few other a few other things here. Uh, thin stripe of pot sleet that we still have out there. Um, I still got to tackle that. It's, again, it's no major no major problem, but it's something I do want to get resolved at some point. This has come up in the VLAB forum, time periods and forecast builder, matching GFE, and then looking at NDFD requirements. That's something we want to tackle with the January tech order and get that kind of straight, straightened all out. Um, wind for pot frost, I think I'll be able to do that. Uh, I mentioned about the snow snow level. We'll, you know, we're going to be researching that, of, of course. And then um, some of the intensity stuff, I think I'll be able to handle that with either add another thing on the weather dialogue and in step six, uh, that's also present in the old pot merge weather. Uh, also, need to talk a about targets of opportunity. Uh, yeah, it's been a top, still a top feedback item about you know a lot of these edits being made that are fairly minor, which cause extra collaboration work. Century is a good team as well as the consistency team are working together to provide guidance. Uh, we're looking at something formal in, in, in January to come out, uh, a, a doc, and also trying to look at maybe a webinar for that. Preliminary thoughts here on a definition is, you know, for what you want to change in forecast is really that though anything that would impact the hazard program or not reflecting current IDSS messaging. So, you know, and not to that, we don't want to go through each grid just to touch it or to make a change on it. Just, just look at those or get those areas that really, you know, are, are big are big for changing your message. And again, that's a, that's a change. And, and again, expect to see more on this when we uh, uh, when the consistency team provides it coming in uh, January. So you know, something you know, things to consider about making you know with with making changes. You know, ten percent of the of your forecast that you make right now is in super blend. So the next the next shift won't uh, you know see much of that change. Models, of course, may swing back. And again, like I mentioned, is does that change change the message of the forecast? You know, there certainly could be more significant things to address, too, that 
you know, maybe it's in the short term period. But there's nothing saying, you know, again, we don't want to say you can't make changes. You can make changes, but, you know, you know, looking at targeted, and here's some examples that where consensus blend can go awry. Uh, you know, last webinar there was a we presented from uh, Boulder of a situation with wind that they still keep running in. They still keep running into is that during these high higher wind events that the consensus blends aren't aren't the may not hit them hit it right. Some of the math guidance and that can be sometimes very useful for for some of these uh, situations. Um, uh, I'm almost near the end of this, so I'll open it up here in just a, in just a minute. Uh, just some forecast reminders that we've had in here for most of the webinars for the ESTF updates. Again, forecast builder use is strongly recommended. Yeah. Again, change grids, as I kind of mentioned before, that affect the weather message. Um, snow amount, ice, accumulate or weather, you know, don't edit those directly. If you have to, um, please let us know through the feedback form what's what you know what's missing. Uh, and then a reminder, you know, I know I've had some questions about this, and uh, that you know, drizzle is a precipitate is set as a precipitating element. So you do need a pop uh, for a grid equal to 15. I know that drizzle can have, per its definition, can be can be basically non precipitating or precipitating, but a couple of years ago, they kind of tested this out to allow that to happen, and it was just a it was just a bear. Uh, it was a bear coding wise. Uh, it was bear on training. The GUIs were uh, were huge to try and allow for this. So simplifying it to just say, hey, it requires a 15 pop, makes it a whole makes a whole lot easier. Makes it just a whole lot easier. Um, it's then too be easier to collaborate and code in, and really. Um, Picking this from another another perspective is about between difference between drizzle and rain, um, well, very light rain, if you will. There's, you know, think about that for another simplification. Uh, we could do. Uh, I'll we'll have to, you know, think about. You know, there's not a whole lot of difference that you know the two, between the two besides that drizzle is two hundredths of a millimeter, something like that, in size. So future um, future development. Uh, there's a. Uh, you know, looking at you know these things called like a hazard recommender. There's a hazard hazard builder um, being, uh, and then a forecast certainty tool. There's just some other things you know to kind of help maybe find targets of opportunity. Some snow verification uh, work uh, is ongoing here. A uh, big one here that we're going to try and get in January is populating probability of thunder from S the SP uh, blend of the SPCS or thunderstorm probabilities, greater mass and greater lamp. Um, just trying to work on getting that SPCS or thunderstorm probability in GFE. Uh, when we get that done, that has to go in the National SmartNet. And again, I'm trying to get that in for the next National SmartNet version. Uh, we've got a basically aviation populate into uh, forecast builder. Uh, we'll have that as an option, and, and that again, that'll be in with with January. And the other two um, things are bigger projects. Good job on feedback. We've got 500 plus forms submitted so far, and again, outside the test bed, getting some great use, great feedback. Thank you. And with that, that is the that is the end. Again, keep providing that feedback. So I will I will open it up. If our, I should say, if anybody has a question, just raise your hand, and I'll try and pass try and go through here and. Uh, Shane, you had something? Yeah, Andy, thanks for the uh, great webinar. Uh, just real quick, uh, let's say that we're just not liking the snow amounts that we're getting out of Forecast Builder, even in the short term. Um, can you uh, just give a brief uh, uh, overview of, of exactly what goes back into that from the foundation and other grids, and, and then explain how we can quickly get that back to kind of where we want it? Yeah, so snow amount is... The pretty simple is going to be QPF times your snow ratio times the probability of snow, and then there might be a little bit of you know with the sleet 
sleep factored in too, where you get the QPF times the sleep times the uh, uh, the probability sleep times a two to one ratio. Uh, those two items go into snowmelt. So if you're not seeing the snow that you like, you know, check a couple things to check would be QPF. Check your snow ratio. Check. Um, Check your probability of snow grids. That you know that you can have, you can check them out there in the step four uh, when they're all when they're all produced. And the probability of snow will be dependent on what your maybe what that temperature criteria is in the GUI. Um, in, in step four, you said you know 34 to 37. Um, and there's also another thing there that after once temperatures exceed 35, snow amount. For, for that for that hour again we're working hourly in the comp computation that hour will be zeroed out for snow so hey, yeah there's a lot of stuff that goes into <laughs> that goes into snow but pretty but pretty simply I would say look at QPF look at your snow ratio and look at the probably snow thanks Andy that was great All right, uh, Chris, you had a question? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Pleasant Hill again. We were just um, going back to the discussion about the, the removal of showers. Would that just be a seasonal thing that you guys are discussing, or um, how would that work? I think that would be, that would be all, to, all together. You know, which again, again, I know it would be kind of a, it would be a little adjustment for like convective scenario where we always have, you know, that ring of, showers and thunderstorms, it would just be now rain and thunderstorms. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks. Hey Andy, this is Mindy in Des Moines as well. Um, we had one other question just that they talked about as well. Um, some feedback for the, the stratiform convective stuff. I guess there's just times where, you know, we aren't getting thunderstorms, but we aren't getting just rain. And I know the public may see that, but I think the showers, I think it'd be somewhat of a disservice to completely get rid of it 100% of the year. Um, I could see it maybe more getting rid of it, like Pleasant Hill just mentioned, during a seasonal time, where maybe in the cold season we have it more, um, just say, stratiform all the time. And then in the, the summer, you know, go back to maybe just... Uh, predominantly uh, the convective form and not the stratiform. So maybe a, a dual purpose kind of thing rather than uh, letting it be a choice year round is kind of my thought. But I'd, I'd hate to see it completely go away, I guess. Yeah I, yeah, I know. I know it's like one of those things. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, the shower, I guess, can give you the, can give a different, per, can give a different perception, if you will, than compared to a, a stratiform. Though I think I think it'd be just something that you know get used to. I mean, one of the one of the issues too. I mean, you, you look at the weather grid as it stands. That you know, one of the things I think benefits that people like to use with showers is to apply these coverage terms to it, like scattered, numerous. That those because those don't exist with rain, you know, or rain or freezing rain or snow. Uh, and that was just the way that things were devised. I mean, we're we're still kind of. Still, the weather grid is still somewhat stuck in pre pre GFE era. <laughs> right. Just trying to handle what we had in the. Yeah. Direct. So some of that scattered wording and stuff would be nice, and and sometimes you know you do have more the convective nature showers where maybe you exactly don't have thunder, but it is more convective ish. So I guess some of that would be nice. Um, I guess the one thing in the summer is usually when we are doing showers and thunderstorms, at least in some of the words, the showers actually get dropped out, so it's, you wouldn't be losing it too much. It's just um, if you don't have the thunder or something's kind of hanging on. I guess I just hate to see it completely blown out so far, but thank you. Yep, you're welcome. All right, the, uh, up in the Duluth office. <laughs> hey, Andy, uh, back to the snow ratios on in Forecast Builder. Um, yep. Something you said back there kind of confused me a little bit. It sounded like you were saying that it was calculating the snow ratios hourly. No, 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 no. The uh, uh, snow. Uh, I was talking about the the snow amount. Uh, the snow amount works out hourly because it's used in 
uh, it, it divides the Q, well, in depth here, divides the QPF evenly right now um, in, into hourly and then, um, you know, because we're trying to use the hourly temperature data, so we'll take the six hour snow ratio times the hourly QPF time and use the, the probability of snow that's determined from the hourly temperature. Yeah, so there is no hourly snow ratio here. We're just using the six-hour six hour snow ratio, applying that to all the... Okay, I, I now I understand, because we have the hourly POT snow grids, yep. and you're talking about multiplying the number of those that's... Um, so that's how we get our 100% of we've got all hundreds in there. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense now. Thank you very much. Yep, no problem. Yeah, a lot of that too. For for reference, we have a, a, there's a, one of the training modules on the calculation of uh, you know snow amount and ice accumulation. Will kind of help to also talk about all that. <laughs> hey Ken, I've uh, unmuted your line. All right. The uh, the question I had was kind of with the showers thing. Um, has anyone done any or have any data or done a study to see if the customers would care either way what we did there? I, mean, I, I don't really care what we do. I just am wondering what they think. Yeah, you know, that's a great that's a great point too. You know, I mean, as we you know as we see it, it's both a precedent. Might be even more so a, what we've kind of developed. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these issues I've noticed, you know, we get wrapped into them because we're weather service and, and this type of thing, and we think we know all those things. But it would be interesting to see what customers have to say, if they really care or not. And, you know, if they don't, that would make life easier for all of us, in my opinion. But uh, okay. that was just my input. It could be fun to put a Facebook post up of saying, do you know the, dif do you, do you know the difference between rain and rain showers? <laughs> All right, um, Audrey, you had your hand up again? Or no, that might have been from before, sorry. <laughs> All right, uh, Pleasant Hill, did, did you have something again? Yeah, this, uh, excuse me, this is Mike uh, in Pleasant Hill. I guess I'm just going to kind of pile on and, and, and beat a dead horse, but I think we need to have that option, at least seasonally, for... Uh, the showers versus rain. It, I guess I'm old school, and 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 as one of the other uh, guys mentioned, I uh, probably need to query our, our customers and find out is it that important to them. But uh, my vote is to at least to have it seasonal, so we have that option. Uh, scattered rain and, and thunderstorms. It just doesn't maybe sound right, and it's not also meteorologically sound. That's just my two cents. Thank thank you there for the. Uh Feedback there for that. I'll keep uh, going along through the. I think I think we got every I think we got everybody. Um, so with that, I will conclude the conclude the webinar. Thanks again, everyone, for attending. It was a good call. Again, a lot of a lot of people on. So thanks, and uh, we'll. Probably schedule another another one of these. Hopefully, one one more before the Christmas holiday. So. Thanks again, all.